Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for this very special event, Reimagining Early Childhood for the 21st Century. My name is Amanda Berry and I'm the Associate Dean Research in the Faculty of Education and it's my pleasure to be hosting this event on behalf of the faculty and the team from the Conceptual Play Lab led by Laureate Professor Marilyn Fleer. As we begin, I wish to acknowledge the land on which this event takes place and pay my respects to the people of the Kulin Nations on whose traditional estates that we meet today and to their ancestors and to the children who we are educating into the future. I also acknowledge other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are present today. So welcome to all of you who have joined us. We have over a thousand registrations from 30 different countries, not including Australia. So this is a truly international event and indicative of the significant attention that the work of the Play Lab is attracting. So hello to all of those of you in Indonesia, Denmark, Norway, Philippines, Samoa, Saudi Arabia, China, England, Singapore, Ireland, Scotland, South Africa, India, Vietnam, Sweden, Malaysia, New Zealand, Ghana, Canada, Lithuania, Greece, Malawi, Portugal, Brazil, Italy, Zimbabwe, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Algeria and Caledonia and any country that I didn't mention of people who are watching right now. Good morning, good afternoon or good evening from wherever you're tuning in. And from wherever you're joining us, we encourage you to interact with us throughout this um, session. If this is intended to be something that you can join into through your questions and comments, that you can submit at any time via the YouTube chat function. And you'll find that on the right hand side of your YouTube screen, but reminder that you need to be logged into YouTube in order to be able to do this. And also encouraging the tweeters amongst you, please use the hashtags that you'll see when we actually get to the presentation so that you can do tagging on Twitter from the presentation and your responses to it and encourage others to interact with us as well. So just before I introduce the presenters, I'd like to say a few words about our research agenda in the Faculty of Education. Important to us is that the research that we do speaks to the challenges, both contemporary and enduring, of educators and education. And our recently released research agenda focuses on five interconnected themes that you can see on your screen there. Reimagining educational leadership, educating for diversity and inclusion, enhancing health and wellbeing, shaping digital futures, and transforming teaching and learning with a central connecting theme of fostering fair and sustainable futures. And the work of the Conceptual Play Lab crosses different areas of these priorities, but tonight highlights a focus on the theme of transforming teaching and learning and the topic specifically that we're focusing on reimagining early childhood for the 21st century. So now let me introduce you to our speakers who are going to be sharing their research with you this evening. And I'll invite them to turn on their video now so that we can see them on screen. And I'll ask them to give a wave as I introduce them, beginning with Laureate Professor Marilyn Fleer. So hi, Marilyn, can you give us a wave? And Marilyn holds the Foundation Chair of Early Childhood Education and Development at Monash. She was awarded the prestigious 2018 Catholic, Kathleen Fitzpatrick Laureate Fellowship by the Australian Research Council. And she holds honorary positions at the University of Oxford, Western Norway University of Applied Sciences and the Danish School of Education at Aarhus. And Marilyn leads the Conceptual Play Lab. That's the focus of the event we're holding. Dr. Kiria Frankiedaki, and can you give us a wave? Yep. She's a senior research fellow in the Faculty of Education at Monash and Glykeria has worked in a range of European academic settings and she also has extensive experience as an early childhood educator and director. And she's leading part of the programmatic study focusing on concept formation of infants, toddlers and preschoolers. Dr Prabhat Rai. Hi. Prabhat Rai has held multiple academic positions in India, UK and Bhutan before joining the Monash Conceptual Play Lab. His research is largely focused on children's learning and development in rural and disadvantaged communities. And next we have Tanya Stevenson. Thanks, Tanya. She's a PhD student at Monash and she's been a member of the Conceptual Play Lab since 2019 and was awarded the Kathleen Fitzpatrick Laureate Scholarship by the Australian Research Council. 
And next, our colleague from the Faculty of Engineering, Dr. Jonathan Lee. Hi, Jonathan. He's an education-focused academic and Deputy Associate Dean Education for First Year Studies in the Faculty of Engineering. And John has a background in electrical engineering and computer science, and in a past life worked in Telstra as a research engineer. Welcome, Jonathan. And finally, Ha Dang. Hi. Uh, so Ha is a joint faculty of engineering and conceptual play lab PhD student, and she has a background in electrical engineering and biomedical science, and also previously worked as an engineer in the telecommunications sector. So they're our fabulous presenters tonight. And the format for this evening's presentation will include um, contributions from our speakers in three separate presentations. And that will be followed by Marilyn who will give a summary and some concluding comments. And after that, we'll open up the panel discussion so that you, our audience, can pose your questions and comments and generate lots of group interaction. And so just remember, you can pose those questions at any time through the YouTube chat function, or you can wait and um, send your questions when we begin the panel discussion. But we'll give you lots of encouragement as we go along this evening. So finally, just before we get started, we have some special mentions of people who are joining us for this event who are associated with the work of the Play Lab and we'd like to, um, we'd like to identify them. So, Professor Marianne Hedegaard from Denmark, Professor Ingrid Pramling Samuelsson from Sweden, Professor Penti Haka Einan from Lithuania, who we anticipate will be a faculty visiting scholar for 2020, along with Professor Milda Bredekate from Lithuania. Professor Daniel Goulart from Brazil and baby two week old Olivia, welcome to the world. Professor Louise Botcher from Denmark, who was our faculty visitor in 2018 for the Play Lab. Professor Lenny Barblett from Perth. Melissa Teo from Minderu in Western Australia. Dr. Esme Kapp from Princess Hill Primary School in Melbourne. Professor Susan Danby, the Director of Centre for Excellence at Queensland University of Technology. Mary Featherston, designer from Melbourne, and Professor Dieter Winter Lindquist from Denmark, who will be hosting at Monash in 2021. So we look forward to seeing her then. And Fiona May, who's the CEO of um, Playgroup Australia. And finally, a very special mention to our incoming Dean in the Faculty of Education, Professor Viv Ellis, who's going to be joining us live streaming from London. So again, welcome to everyone. We're really thrilled to be able to host this event. It is a truly international event, so being in the live stream situation makes it even more exciting here. So thank you all. And now thanks also to our first speaker, Laureate Professor Marilyn Fleer, who will be presenting with Miss Tanya Stevenson. So over to you, Marilyn. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. And welcome, everyone. Um, to our public lecture. It's very exciting to, uh, to be 12 months down the track since our launch. Um, the, uh, what's very special about this, for those of you who, haven't, who were not at the launch, is that um, this is um, uh, the work that we've been doing in our conceptual play lab is funded by the um, Australian Research Council as part of their Laureate Fellowship um, um, uh, program. Uh, or scheme. So, um, so we're uh, very thrilled to be here tonight as a as a team, and um, and so I want to just share with you a little bit about how we're going to be presenting tonight. Um, the conceptual play lab uh, is focused around focused on the area of imagination in play and imagination in STEM. But to take that work forward, uh, we have three interrelated areas that our senior research fellows will be talking to and their teams um, tonight, and we'll only be able to give snapshots, so a little taste of the kind of things that we've been learning. Um, our first uh, area, for those of you who are not familiar with it, that um, we're uh, exploring is in relation to following infants um, as they become toddlers and as they become preschoolers, learning concepts um, around STEM. So we're really curious about that over time and we have, we have some time to follow them thanks to the Australian Research Council. Our second area um, that is a focus of our programmatic research is looking at um, STEM learning in family homes. And, um, and so we, go, we're, uh, we have a, a very large program of activities and later you'll hear of some of the innovations that we've had to, uh, that we've, we've generated as part of that kind of research that's really important. And the third area 
um, is the um, taking forward our conceptual um, play world model, our evidence-based model across Australia. So they are our three, three areas, all interrelated as you'll see tonight. So if we go to the next slide, well, for those of you who attended the launch last, last year, you will have met Cassie at the age of four and we want to link with that um, tonight and um, explore some, some interesting ideas to take us forward. So Cassie at four, um, we're going to sh share the video clip with you again tonight and, um, and we're also going to meet her at the age of eight as part of what we're um, presenting. So one of the things just to orient everyone was that we see Cassie here and, um, and we'll see the video in a moment of her explaining a particular design, a collective design that came through the work of um, the children and the play that they were um, exploring in a centre. And, um, and the children were exploring STEM concepts. But they were using the uh, story of, um, they're using the story of Robin Hood as the um, conceptual um, play world that was created. And the design that you see here in the, um, in the next um, slide is, is the grabby hand machine that Cassie is actually explaining. And, um, and in the third image that you see is actually, we'll see this in a moment as a video clip, is augmented reality of her um, and the other children, um, which brings the reality of the, well, brings, brings forward the, uh, the kind of um, STEM learning that the children are exploring. So this is one of the artifacts that was produced in the conceptual play um, world of the children. So we'll have a look at Cassie first at four, and you'll see also the um, where that sits within this poster of this particular design, which is a, a grabby hand machine to retrieve the treasure from the castle um, and redistribute the wealth, as is, of course, the, the story of Robin Hood. So if we could take a look at the video now. This is the moon. Oh. And the fulcrum is the elbow. Right. So the fingernails can fold up because the tiny treasures can sit, slip inside them, then the grabby hand will pull it up. Okay, so you're all back. You've seen the video clip, and um, what we're um, if we could move to the next slide. So now we're going to meet Cassie at eight, and uh, where she um, is at home, and she's speaking with her family, um, and we're going to see, uh, we're going to hear and see her enthusiasm for STEM. So if we could play the video, please. Are you are interested in engineering, do you think, in that part yeah, of science? Yeah, I love engineering and science. I love making potions. You do do that. That's I true. I like potions a lot. Like, there are some containers I have at home, and I just like to put some flower petals in and some grass. And I, I like, my friends like making perfume, but I like making potions. Yeah. you're back. Now we've met Cassie at four and now we've met her at eight. So the big question for us was why? Go to the next slide. The big question for us was why is Cassie so engaged in STEM at eight? 
We measure at four, enthusiastic and um, speaking lots of really wonderful, um, wonderful comments, making wonderful comments about STEM. But what actually happened? So we were really curious about this. We wanted to know why she was so engaged in STEM. What was it about her experience at four that stayed with her to eight years of age? So we decided that what we'd liked, what we did, and um, was go back to the data in relation to Cassie's experiences and her motives for STEM. And that's really the focus of the first part of tonight's presentation. If you go to the next slide. So the first part of our presentation is where Tanya and I will be presenting. And we're going to be looking at um, this snapshot around why was it that Cassie was so interested, so motivated? What was it about her experience? What happened to her and the other children in the preschool that made this difference? And we're going to focus on um, how a conceptual play world for STEM can be transformative of as a model of practice for girls. I'm going to be talking specifically about Cassie and then Tanya is going to be talking and showcasing more broadly from our pilot data. If we could go to the next slide. But before we begin to share with you, with you what we learned, important for us was also understanding the problem. What's in the literature? What is it that we understand about the challenges in STEM from such a young age. And there has been over many years um, a, a consistent pattern to that. And so very briefly, and there's much more than I'm going to be able to share tonight, but these gender divergences appear uh, as early as, uh, as four years and even earlier with some studies. What those studies collectively show is that um, there is a rush for resources, STEM resources, and um, girls are often persuaded to relinquish the resources once they do have them. Um, there is also um, shown that in this research that free play settings, um, uh, in free play settings, boys use more technical language. Girls position them, themselves as helpers and one of the studies showed very clearly how boys were constructing with blocks and the girls were passing the blocks to support their build. There's also research that shows that boys occupy more space than the girls across the board in preschool settings. And that uh, boys seem to play with construction materials and use more space than girls, but play in particular ways. Boys tend to construct and knock down their buildings, whilst girls tend to construct and play with what they have created. Boys create more moving parts in some of the studies than girls do, and girls um, create more imaginative um, scenes with the materials and resources available in STEM. Also, girls create micro spaces to feel safe, and, um, and that this um, gives them a place where they can play unencumbered. So the, these kinds of studies and more around to illustrate some of the things, some of the challenges that we've noted. And what is, what is the result of this? Well, we can say that girls construct and build with a particular purpose in mind to actually use the construction. We can say that girls and boys learn to handle materials differently. And we can say, also say that there is a difference in the access to the STEM resources. And this means that girls have less experience with STEM materials in preschool. And some research suggests that this builds over the course of children's lives and accumulates so that um, when they make choices later on in STEM subjects, they make them in particular ways that have um, illustrative of their early experiences of not actually getting involved or having hands-on experiences. Sociologists have explained this in a number of ways and some STEM researchers have picked up on this work. So briefly, to try and understand this problem, that, um, that there are these micro assaults on a person's identity is one way that it's explained. That raises the view that the girls just simply don't belong in STEM. There are micro insults, which are unintentional stereotypes or unconscious bias we hear a lot of in the literature as well. So simple comments like, oh, how different it might be to think about a girl in doing engineering. 
uh, as a future profession. And there are also micro invalidations and where these gestures um, of micro insults and micro assaults over time build. And even though they might seem small, they accumulate, suggesting that STEM is not for girls. So building that kind of identity. So in our conceptual play lab, of course, we're, we see this as a uh, not just a, a social justice issue, but actually a gender uh, justice issue. And so we were very interested then coming back to, um, to see if we could go to the next slide, please. What was different for the girls in the conceptual play world? Why was it that Cassie and the other girls seem to be active, as actively involved as the boys in the conceptual play world of Robin Hood. What was making the biggest difference to their identity in STEM? And because we had used um, an educational experiment drawing on the works of Marianne Hedegaard and um, others that had inspired her, such as Davidoff, um, and we were very interested to be able to go back to this data to have a look at it with this big question in mind and take that forward. We could go to the next slide, please. So what did we learn when we started to look at the, the, the data? The first thing that we noticed that was different was that the um, play worlds, the conceptual play worlds, appeared to create new spaces. And illustrated here is a floor plan made by the, the teacher um, of, the, of the, the existing space, but actually transformed to be different to, um, different to what was there. So we learned that, um, that the conceptual play world became a motivator for teachers to create new kinds of learning spaces in the center. So going beyond the traditional areas, such as the home corner, the block area, um, and, and so on, construction, kits and tables and so on. This floor plan shows you kind of new naming of the, some of the spaces, as you see there, time machine in the outdoor area, a fort um, has become a castle and so on, the block building area, the home corner and, and some of the other spaces. But we see drawing is now a designing area. So these were no longer um, learning, learning spaces or play spaces, but they were being conceptualized by the children and the teachers as a play world of Robin Hood. The whole, the whole center or classroom was being transformed. And what we noticed in our, the data is that the girls appeared to be uh, all in this new imagined area as much as the boys. They were on the fort in the time machine going back in time to Robin Hood. They were using the boxes and uh, blocks to create and transform different areas. So we go to the next slide. So these transformations, such as this, created different ways in which the space was being used. So we were curious to understand how the new kinds of learning spaces in the centre had changed the way the children played. If we could go to the next slide. So what did we notice? That the new space spaces created different ways that children were actually playing. The centre had, had become a um, distributed model of spaces to resource the collective play of the children. And the collective imagining of being in Sherwood Forest going back in time gave new ways that children could interact with each other. They were playing in new ways, but also the teachers were part of this as play partners. So the new spaces meant that there were different kinds of interactions. We go to the next slide, please. But we wanted to know why. We were curious to understand how the new kinds of learning spaces in the centre had changed the interactions of the children. Particularly given the literature I pointed out to you earlier on in, very, in a very brief form. What we learned was that the collective imagining meant that the teachers and the children, because they were no longer in a classroom, they were acting as if they were scientists or engineers, technologists, or being in role as Maid Marian and Robin Hood, undertaking all sorts of interesting um, role play. The new activity settings 
appear to disrupt the gendered ways of interacting that we noticed in the literature. And we think that what was really important here was that the teacher was inside the imaginary play with the children so that they could notice any kinds of the microaggressions that the sociologists have drawn attention to. And Tanya's going to speak more about this. So the traditional areas were being used in completely new ways to be collectively be imagining. And this afforded new ways of playing and the spaces in the spaces and new ways of interacting. Go to the next slide, please. So to pull this together, we wanted to flip this. So if we're thinking about a gender justice issue, we believe that the new spaces gave new possibilities for girls and opened up areas of the centre, usually difficult for girls to enter into and play. And so what we noticed were there were these kind of micro messaging happening. So when acting as if engineers and scientists, we, had, we constantly heard things, made Marion as the head engineer and so on. So different kinds of positive messaging was being given to the girls in particular. The new practices were named um, as part of the imaginary play. So working in teams as engineers or being scientists researching, um, going back in time as historians to interview the castle engineer using iPads and other kinds of technology um, to understand um, engineering principles in order to constantly enrich the play. STEM became personally meaningful. And the social purpose of the STEM really mattered because the social problems of helping the villagers, as we saw with Cassie at four, to create a grabby hand machine to retrieve the treasure so she could redistribute the wealth, really mattered. And so children were designing simple machine to do this and um, preparing prototypes, testing these out, designing escape routes so the play became deeper and more exciting over time. So the new spaces with the positive, positive micro-messaging uh, was building an identity that this space is for me. If we could go to the next slide. What also mattered was the adults being inside the conceptual play world with the children. And again, Tanya will speak more about this. But in this context, the micro positioning was something we noticed, where the adults, the educators, um, were supporting the girls in particular to build an identity that this experience is for me. We go to the next slide. And what we collectively thought was that these kinds of micro-messaging and micro-positioning all very positively within the context of children's play, imagining as if they're engineers, scientists, as if Robin Hood, as if Maid Marian as the lead engineer. All of these experiences were giving children, um, the girls in particular, but all the children, uh, through the conceptual play world, um, very different experiences and the technical language that was embedded in the, in the play world, in the conceptual play world, was accessible to all the children and particularly the girls. No negotiating of entering spaces, they were in the space. And they were building competence and confidence in STEM. So in many respects, this micro-validation of their experiences we're building an identity that STEM is for me. This takes us to our last slide. Oh, and that was what, uh, yes. So the last slide here is to say, oh, we could go back, sorry. <laughs> the last slide is to say what we learned in the other direction. Yeah, thank you. What we learned is with the building an identity that STEM is for me, we learned this, but we don't know. What we don't know is how broadly based a conceptual play world is for building that identity across centres. So we know it for Cassie and we know it for her peers, but we don't know more. 
So Tanya is now going to talk about the pilot data and, um, and share with us how she's taken this problem forward in her presentation. So Tanya, over to you. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, so this one was an example of Cassie's and my mind. In the pilot data, we look across more settings. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we looked across various centers in different contexts, different educators, and across different age groups of children. The educators were involved in two hours of professional development, and we used the same workshop for all educators. So in, in addition to being video recorded, the educators used the FLIRS Conceptual Playboard app to record some of their practices. And what we learned through the focus group interviews with the educators drew on what they selected as examples of their Playboard in practice. Um, we observed the key role of the educators when they were inside the Playboard versus when they were outside the Playboard. And we saw some commonalities in terms of the teacher's interactions with the children when outside the Playboard and inside the Playboard. Um, I will present two examples of some of these common occurrences that happened as a quick snapshot of some of our findings in this area. Both examples here are from the same center and with the same group of children. The first involves being outside the Playboard and the second is of being inside the Playboard. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this is what we noticed when the children were outside the Playboard and they were not imagining together. They were engaged in the normal, the traditional child initiated play during the time where they could select what they wanted to do. So in the first image, we can see Nick and Rena in the block corner constructing a rocket ship while Harry watches them build. When the teacher steps in, she looks at the construction and says, is he building, is Nick building a machine? Yeah, the rocket ship says Nick. Rena listens to this interaction. And a few seconds later, you can see her stop building. And she moves away to sit with the teacher instead and watches Nick continue to build. This was the dominant practice outside the play world. And this is just a quick snapshot of the various uh, microaggressions we saw girls experience across the different age groups in different STEM related areas outside the play world. We also noticed that in this example where the youngest child was two years and three months old, that these patterns are being established very early on. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so, however, uh, when the same teachers and the children were in the conceptual play world together, we noticed that these microaggressions seem to disappear. This is one such example inside the play world where everyone is engaged in the imaginary situation, pretending to be different characters in a story, ready to fly off into the sky together. The teacher calls out that everyone must get ready for takeoff. And she asks the children what to do with their feet and they quickly stomp the ground. We create speed, lift our noses in the air, take off and thrust forward. The teacher and the children hold their arms out in front of them and pretend to fly together. Here, the teachers are in character with the children and therefore more in tune with each child's character, allowing them to more easily notice and deal with these microaggressions. The children, the boys and the girls are equally engaged and the microaggressions disappear, therefore transforming the girls' experiences with STEM. And this supports the work that Marilyn just highlighted. Um, but adding to this, we also see a positive impact for the families. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Oh, there should be one for that. Yep, thank you. Um, so this is a reflection from one of the dads whose daughter was under three years old and engaged in the conceptual play world sequence where everyone was flying together. He talks about how when him and his daughter were walking home from the center and he asked her about her day, she said, mine was a yellow bird. And they ended up talking about an aeroplane since he had noticed in the room, they had aeroplanes in relation to the play world where they were looking at thrust and lift. And she was fascinated by how things fly up. And when she looked at a car, she said, that not fly away. He said, she usually wouldn't be as excited about STEM. But here, from the collective imagination and STEM-related dramatic play, she could make that connection to a car and understand that it can't fly away. 
he said, you could see that little brain ticking going, what can fly away? He went on to appreciate that while she was thinking about this, she was not hitting a limit of learning. Instead, the conceptual play world opened up a whole new opportunity for her to continue to explore. So we know now about Cassie at four, Cassie at eight, and the broader picture. Um, but how does this relate to the sense of collectiveness? How does that sense of collectiveness come about? We often assume that it simply happens. Dr. Glakiria Frakiadaki will now share how collective imagination can lead to a sense of collectiveness and the development of collectiveness over time. Thank you so much, Tanya. So we would like to share some more uh, exciting findings of the programmatic study and give an, ins an insight into how collective imagining can lead to the early genesis and development of a sense of collectiveness during infancy, and also how collective imagining can create the conditions for participation in collective STEM experience for very, very young learners. So, next slide, please. What we know is that uh, on entering formal education, infants face the demand, the huge demand for participating in collective educational routines and also collective learning experiences. However, we do know also that in this age period, the sense of collectiveness is still in an embryonic stage and has not developed yet. So this contradiction actually leads us to the question of how infants' orientation to the collective can be developed and supported into the everyday education reality of childcare centers and also early childhood settings in general. So what we have learned from our research with infants uh, uh, it's between uh, five months and two and three months, and it actually appears to be particularly new, is that um, collective imagining within conceptual play worlds can create the challenges and also can create the possibilities and the opportunities for the early genesis and development of a sense of collectiveness for infants. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. So, and one more, please. In particular, the evidence has shown that being in a collective imaginary situation within a conceptual play world, uh, infants can, can actually involve the, the experience collectively through their role playing, expressed by body positioning and gestures and the tone of their voice and also through using different and diverse props such as puppets, diverse materials, everyday objects. Beyond physical objects and concrete spaces, infants can share also an intellectual and an abstract space since being in a collective uh, conceptual play world uh, and being uh, in an imaginary situation, uh, infants actually uh, focus their attention there and also conceptual play worlds create shared meanings and understandings and also engage infants with a specific project over time as uh, during the, the time period that the conceptual play world is actually implemented. Uh, and also the conceptual play world enable infants to transfer the content of an imaginary situation into diverse activity settings. Uh, it was also shown that infants not only uh, join the group activity settings, but also at the same time contribute to the activities and also shape the activities in a way that's actually meaningful for them, but at the same time is also meaningful, meaningful for the other members of the group. And importantly, the analysis of the qualitative data have showed that when the teachers, when the educators are in the imaginary situation themselves as play partners, interactions uh, between the infants and the peers and the teachers are initiated, uh, expand and deepen as part of their shared experience. So taking together these key themes, 
uh, uh, taking together uh, these important findings, inform everyday practice and inform policy, opening actually up, uh, opening up a new area of understanding about the concept of collective imagining as a critical concept of the development of a collective orientation in early childhood settings, and, new, and also about a new practice and a new pedagogy that actually support collective imagining and support collectiveness in early years, and also creates a dynamic space for collective engagement, learning and development stack. So, and next slide, please. From this standpoint, we continue expanding and deepening our longitudinal study, exploring how collective imagining is developed during infancy. Uh, next, please. And how was the collective imagining is developed over time as infants grow up, becoming toddlers, and then preschoolers. And importantly, next slide, please. Thank you. And importantly, we also explore how a wide range of everyday concepts and scientific concepts in STEM become accessible to young learners through collective imagining. So I will now hand over to Prabhat to talk more about the innovating and exciting ways through which our research continue, continues to explore and support young children, children's engagement in STEM, in family and also community settings. Prabhat? Yeah, thank you, Dekaria. And hello, everybody. Uh, one of our theoretical concerns uh, to engage in uh, family settings uh, is to uh, have a holistic understanding of children's concept formation and understand the inter-institutional transitions in the early years. So far, we have heard today about the evidence emerging from our research in the last one year. Me and our team from the engineering faculty uh, would try to give a sense of some of the emerging and in many ways, innovative ways of engaging with children in family and community settings. You will hear more about these interventions as we go on in this research journey in the coming years of the Play Lab. Uh, today, we will talk more about the design principles and the digital tools uh, in this segment of the presentation. Now, as part of our programmatic study, we uh, would be working with around 100 families in Victoria and across Australia, understanding how families create motivating conditions for children's STEM concept formation in early years. We know from uh, previous uh, research of Professor Marianne Hedegaard and Professor Marilyn Fleer that different institutional practices have their own demands. They have argued that institutional practices frame the activities a person act within these institutional practices. So uh, we are making an attempt then to transform some of these institutional practices so that children are more aware of their everyday experiences and learn STEM concepts. Uh, conceptual play world from that standpoint is not a model of homeschooling. It is not about bringing school to your home or doing away with the early care centers. Conceptual play world for families rather accentuate and support children's learning in home or for that matter, any other setting. More recently, we have also been working with other informal spaces like the Royal Botanic Garden. But all these interventions are largely guided by clear principles for practice. Probably uh, it might be worth uh, engaging with some of those uh, principles uh, in, in, the, in, in today's presentation. Can we move to the next slide? Yeah. Uh, like any other activity setting uh, inhabited by humans, play is also a socially articulated space, which means that we create play settings. In the conceptual play world model, we are guided by uh, some of uh, the following four principles deserve to design the activity setting. The first is that we intend to achieve children and their families long-term well-being from the perspective of social justice. Uh, through empirical data, Marilyn and Tanya have showed our commitment to this principle. Uh, conceptual play world values children and their families' agentic engagement in their children's development. This play world is not a given model of practice, but rather a collective or common fiction being developed in collaboration with families. 
Uh, secondly, uh, it supports children's effective engagement and playfulness. The design of Play World enhances and affords more possibility for children's playfulness, thus supporting their effective expressions like excitement, joy, dramatic tensions, challenges, explorations, fear of failing, and sometimes the delight of succeeding as well. So adults uh, in this setting have a very active role to play and engage with children. Uh, thirdly, conceptual play world as an activity setting also offers opportunities for robust concept learning. It means that children are more aware of their everyday experiences and thus employ their experiences in gaining insight into the academic concept. It also creates insight for them to explore more than what is given in the story. For example, uh, in Rosie's walk, when we ask children that Rosie's friend Alia is about to visit her and can they draw a map so that she can reach her house without being caught by the fox? Uh, children ask all kinds of interesting questions that how far does this friend live? How is she coming as if Rosie has a car? Uh, can we make a back view mirror helmet for Rosie? like a car has, uh, Rosie, uh, Rosie probably would be safe with this back view mirror helmet because next time the fox chases her, she'd be able to see her. All these affordances are possible uh, and make children more aware of what they are engaging while trying to solve a particular problem. Uh, these intentional engagements create possibilities for children to learn uh, a number of concepts uh, for example, in Rosie's walk uh, play world, they have learned the ideas of mapping, reflection, scale, measurement, but without regimentation of play, which is the leading motive of children in this age period. Thus, it also challenges the dominant pushdown or schoolification model of su supporting children's learning, which reaches home setting from schools or early care centers. Uh, lastly, the conceptual play world offers possibility for exploration and transformative potential of imagination. Children sometimes identify with a character in ways beyond our imagination. We did Rosie's Walk uh, conceptual play world with my daughter a few days back. And after the session was over, she came to me and said, Papa, I want to be like a Rosie, a very brave girl. Even when the fox was chasing her, she went on uh, her walk. It, I want to be like a Rosie. The other day she mentioned to me that she want to be a scientist fairy. These interesting identifications and emotional engagements to children's imagination make them more fully human and employ imagination for their well-being and not merely as a skill to complete a task. This also helps children to develop a new narrative in their social situation of development. As Madeline said, STEM is for me. Uh, can we go to the next slide please? Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, this, this is one part of our engagement. Our second aspect of engagement of working with families and communities has led us to work with Playgroup Australia, one of the Australia's largest not-for-profit organization running around 7,500 community playgroups and offering possibility for 150,000 parents, carers, and children to meet on a regular weekly basis. Unlike the family setting, where parents have continuous and endless time to keep the story of Play World alive, we got around 30 minutes in play groups to work with parents and their children. Our recent research work with one of the play groups in Melbourne Southeast, led by our PhD student, Cindy Wong, has made an attempt to develop a conceptual play world on the famous Julia Donaldson story, The Gruffalo. At the time when we had to stop because of the COVID-19 restrictions, Singhi made a considerable progress in developing a model that can work in a multi-age, multicultural, multilingual communities, and above all, a playgroup setting which has multiple adults. This conceptual play world model for playgroup creates possibility for parents to sustain the inquiry and exploration whose seeds are sown in the playgroup. In essence, these pedagogic engagements were not only about introducing problems, but they were about engaging children in the problems uh, what, and, and what matters for them in their community settings and in their society. 
Moreover, it also helped to develop a learning motive in children and offer them possibilities of exploration and imaginative thinking, and even to those who cannot access regular early care centers. Uh, can we move to the next slide? Uh, and that takes me to the last part of our today's presentation, which is uh, basically around the digital tools. While designing these digital tools, uh, three uh, broad principles have guided us to develop a pedagogic narrative, to sustain children's playfulness and using 21st century digital tools uh, so that we can amplify children's experiences. Uh, this has also led us to develop a number of tools. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, like the eClever cards, AR and VR tools, the playable starters and the spatial games. Uh, before I hand over to John and Ha, it would be worth highlighting that we are not merely contributing to the rhetoric of reimagining early years education at a time when there is a radical transformation happening in our and surely our children's ways of engaging with the world. It would be worth mentioning that we are trying to use technology to create new affordances from a design principle rather than merely a tool for replicating what otherwise can happen in presence or proximity of human. So we are not just responding to the question of technology for reach as we are hearing in these times of crisis. In our case, it also means amplifying and enhancing uh, children's experiences using AR and VR tools, which can create further possibilities of being immersed and emotionally aroused while listening or engaging with a story. Uh, with this, I will hand over to John and Ha. Thanks, Prabhat, for the introduction. Well, we've heard how the conceptual play worlds have the power to transform early childhood education. And as an engineer, I believe this is an absolutely marvelous way to engage and teach children. In engineering though, we know from repeated experience that the best technical solutions that we might come up with will be pretty useless if people don't want to use them, either out of fear of change or of the unknown, for instance. So in partnership with the Play Lab, we wondered how we could use technology to lower the barrier to entry for our educators to feel confident enough to go out and try to implement the play world concept in their own settings or homes or play groups. Next slide, please. Uh, next one as well, thanks. Uh, so one simple but important project that we worked on together was to redevelop the older iOS only version of the conceptual play world app so that it would be able to run across both Android and iOS. The purpose of this was to enable a wider range of educators to be able to download and use it to learn about and engage with conceptual play worlds. And this was done entirely by one of our Monash engineering alumni, Mon uh, Moses Wan, who's shown here. Next slide, please. Marilyn and her team have always been um, very quick to adopt new technologies for education, one of which is virtual reality or VR for short. Uh, virtual reality is where a participant can put on a headset, uh, as shown in the top right, that fills your entire vision with a virtual scene. It has the ability to really immerse someone in a virtual environment in a way that just watching a video can't do justice. And so we wanted to explore how we could enable educators to really experience how a play world could work and really get them thinking about how to translate it to their own setting. So along with an engineering final year project student, Abby, shown down below, we set up multiple 360 degree cameras so that we could capture multiple angles of a conceptual play world in action. We then put this into VR and added the ability to play and pause the scenes, as well as to allow expert commentary to be interspersed throughout the scene. We've got some footage of that, uh, of what the educator would really experience from an early prototype in the next slide. And in this case, we use some pilot footage recorded by Prabhat in COVID-19 lockdown to demonstrate the concept. While in reality, we would obviously want to take uh, footage of a play world in action in a larger setting with more children. And on the next slide, which I ask now, we'll show you this. This video shows the view from within a VR headset of a scene where Prabhat is running a conceptual play world activity for his daughter. As we look around the room, we can see another camera within the scene, and if we interact with it, we teleport to view the scene from an alternative angle. We're now looking at the same scene from the second camera set at the child's height, which is a viewing angle that adults may have long forgotten about, which really helps us to empathise with the children. We're also able to pause the scene, 
by interacting with the floating buttons in case we need to stop a bit and think about what we're observing. Finally, at certain points within the scene, we have the capability to bring in expert commentary via 2D video pop-ups, which in this case are incorporated seamlessly into the scene as a TV on the wall. Finally, our engagement with the Conceptual Play Lab hasn't just been in the shiny toys domain. Uh, we're also fostering fundamental research collaboration uh, with an amazing joint PhD student, Ha Dang, whose goal overall is to raise future female participation in engineering. And with that, I'd like to pass over to Ha to discuss her research and also shows off some more shiny toys. Thank you, John. Um, hi, everyone. Um, as John mentioned, the ultimate goal of um, the PhD research is to lift female participation in engineering in future. Um, next slide, please. So, and we are proposing to do that through spatial play in early childhood. Um, so in the research, we'll be looking at how children develop spatial reasoning skills through play, specifically in the home environment. Um, but there's no reason why the findings cannot be extended or adapted to uh, our, our early childhood educational settings. Um, so we argue that uh, spatial play in early childhood will help predispose children um, to spatial and mathematical concepts early on. Um, spatial reasoning skills um, refer to the ability to imagine and manipulate objects in one's mind. And spatial reasoning skills have been found to have um, strong foundational links to mathematics and also crucial um, to participation and success in STEM. So uh, by uh, predisposing children in early childhood, we help to increase their interest, confidence and ability. Um, as Marilyn mentioned earlier, to help them build an identity that uh, STEM is for me. Um, and so uh, that identity and, and interest and confidence would help um, children to engage in maths and science and the abstract thinking that um, are required in engineering later in life. Next slide, please. So the research um, will work with families to build spatial pedagogic narratives and we'll be exploring the family practices that enable children to um, engage in spatial play and facilitate their spatial thinking and development. Um, some of the research tools uh, will be children's picture books and narrative rich physical games and virtual games. And as Prabhat mentioned earlier, the three key components are playfulness, um, pedagogic narrative, and 21st century tools. Next slide, please. Speaking uh, of the um, virtual um, games, we've got a team of um, highly, highly enthusiastic and highly capable um, engineering final year project students working on multiple mobile um, apps. Um, and these will help um, children uh, learn about mental rotation, um, shape composition and decomposition and spatial relations. And we'll have um, more in future as we've got uh, more groups of um, final year project students coming through. Um, so next, um, we'd like to show you a short video. Um, it is a demo of a prototype of um, our augmented reality, AR, uh, nano play world, if you like, uh, based on the popular children's book, Rosie's Walk, um, which is um, quite rich in spatial content. And here is the video. This video shows an augmentation of the classic children's book, Rosie's Walk. We're aiming to introduce children to visual spatial language and reasoning within a playful context. As we reach the page where Rosie walks across the yard, we can bring in our mobile device to augment the scene. Here, the child can interact with the scene, resetting Rosie's position and then making Rosie walk across the yard to really associate the language and concept together. We hope this nano play world can capture children's attention and interest with its fun and playful aesthetic that the children can relate to, hopefully without needing to cut out pages from any books in the process. And um, now Marilyn will now come back with a few concluding remarks. Thanks, Marilyn. Thank you, Ha. 
So we're bringing this um, together now, if we go to the last slide. Um, thank you for everyone for participation. And I know we're going to Q&A shortly, but you can, can hear from all of the presenters how we individually and collectively are trying to take forward new ways of thinking about early childhood education, the ch children's play and learning. And, and conceptual play worlds we're finding is a transformative tool for supporting new ways of doing things. So creating new spaces gives new possibilities. Creating new tools gives new interactional patterns of, of play and learning. And so we're learning over these next four years um, how, how these things can support educators in the field, but also to reimagine the kind of spaces that we have have become embedded as traditional practices. So the early childhood centre centres, as they are, have been that way for a very long time now. So this gives us new ways of thinking about STEM, girls, new ways of supporting families, and new learnings that will come from this. But essentially, what we is underpins our work in relation to um, imagination and play and imagination in STEM is that. In a time of schoolification of early childhood, we cannot lose, lose play as the leading activity of the preschool child. So everything we're doing in the Play Lab is geared around that. And as you can hear, we've got wonderful partnerships with the Faculty of Engineering and their students and our shared uh, PhD student, Ha. These are just prototypes and examples of how we want to take things forward. But play is at the core. And play is, of course, the leading activity of the child and how they develop. And we don't, we want to keep that, even in a time when different governments and different um, communities are demanding more of preschool settings and schools. We know that even in our pilot work in schools, that play really matters. It is transformative. So I can play that. We hope to continue to work with you to make this difference, to take this thinking forward, and to not only imagine new imaginings of early childhood, but actually have the kinds of resources and tools that give social justice, gender justice, and give the possibilities for new ways of thinking about and pushing against the, the loss of play and the loss of early childhood that some countries around the world are struggling with. So we will build, continue to build the evidence over the next um, five years, four to five years. We hope to keep going after that. So I'll close there and pass over to Mandy, who I think is going to do some fielding of questions. I am. Thanks very much, Marilyn. Would you like to say anything about the PhD scholarship just before we go to the panel? Yes. And, of course, all that big agenda that we have, we need more people. So we would love to hear from anyone who's interested in the scholarship that they would like to take up full time, a domestic um, candidate, um, and also... We hope to also advertise for a startup of a postdoc in 2021 if there's anyone out there interested as well. Thank you, Mandy. Thanks very much. Thanks to Marilyn. Thanks to all of our presenters, Marilyn, Glykiria, Prawat, Tanya, Jonathan, Ha, you've done a fantastic job. Uh, really, I have personally really enjoyed this and also I'm sure the audience has as well, our audience of over 500 people who have been online, so that's really impressive. Um, so these fascinating insights that you've shared about the research emerging from the conceptual play world, I think as the researchers have shown, this is highly innovative and transformative work that attends not only to the development of children's sort of technical and STEM skills, but understandings and their broader social justice aspects. So it's a very complex agenda that is being taken forward here and I think the presenters have done a fantastic job in helping us to see into those worlds that are being created by this team and that we hope will flourish for years to come. So everyone turn on your cameras now because we're keen to begin some interaction with our audience and it's our audience's opportunity to engage with you now with um, comments and uh, questions. And I have a question to start off with. Maybe it's for you, Marilyn, or maybe that you can direct it to the appropriate person. But in terms of the, the concepts in the play world, what's the process of choosing a concept and how does it get developed into a play world? And I noticed on a slide earlier, there was a mention of um, this is a collective um, process, but I'm just fascinated about how you 
how you identify concepts and how then you build a play world around them. Well, I'll, I'll open it up to the team, but to Glicaria, would you like to um, respond to start with and then um, others may wish to contribute to this because it's a really good question. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you, Merlin, too. I think that uh, the main point for us, the inspiration for creating a conceptual play world is always a children's book, a story that is engaging to children, that is engaging also for the educators, and where we can search and find a problematic situation, a, a problem that has to be solved. So that is uh, that actually lead us to trying to find which concepts can we use in order to do, to to resolve that problem. So children's books, uh, children's stories, uh, is always uh, the inspiration to create uh, a conceptual play world. Of course, it's a flexible model. So if somebody has more uh, inspiring ideas, they are always welcome. <laughs> okay, thank you. So anybody else from the team want to comment on that before I um, take it out to the other some other questions? Uh, it looks like I preempted something that you might have a slide to describe, is that right? Glicaria, do you want to continue or pr uh, Prabha? Maybe you could, Prabha. No, just to add to Glicaria's point that uh, often in the family setting, uh, when we discuss about doing a story, uh, doing a play world, uh, the story sometimes come from the children. So it's not that we impose a story uh, to the families, but sometimes children do have their interesting characters, which they are very interested and keen on. And uh, it also keeps their uh, you know, intentional engagement in the story uh, over a period of time. So uh, it, it's, 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 a, it's a, in a way a conversation that is being built over a period of time uh, in, in the process of development of a conceptual play world. Okay. So the notion of the collective then obviously is yeah. uh, emphasized through that. And I can see there that you've got some links. And um, just to remind everybody that this is being recorded and we'll send you a link to the recording. So if you're worried about not being able to find those um, links now, don't worry, we'll follow up with you and um, share them with you. Uh, so Grace, I think do you have a question that has come from the group to the panel. Yeah, I do. So I have a question here from Pushpa and she's asking, is it necessary to use the stories for creating the problems to solve? Could we just use any existing problem the children are facing so that they could collectively design and solve the problem? Uh, I, I could start and my colleagues can continue. Um, I, what's very important, of course, is, is um, child initiated play and problems that arise in children's play. One of the things that we find really helpful in a conceptual play world is, is um, a story, a storybook gives, um, gives a, a collective narrative, which means that children already know, um, they already know the story plot, but you can have problems that arise and the, it's almost like a, a glue that holds the children together. It means that children who have challenges in entering a play um, don't face that because they're already part of the play world. And children who have language express, expression challenges, uh, for instance, may, may find it difficult to enter a, a, um, a, a play situation. And so therefore, um, what happens is in a play, conceptual play world, they can actually, like we've been talking about Rosie's walk, they can just make the sound of the chicken and, um, and the other children know what the child with language expression challenges is, is trying to communicate so that it's much more inclusive. Now, that's one of, the, one of the key things that we find that's really important. But also in a conceptual play world, and it is the, the idea of um, the story having some sort of drama and uh, with social problems that arise that need to be solved. And so the storying and the role playing and the acting as if in character actually can grow. That, and in that growth of that, then solutions to problems and research can be done by the children to deepen, to solve the problem and to deepen the, um, the play. So these are things that are quite dynamic. It's, so it's not just to, to exclude um, the starting point as being a problem, 
but it's it's that the storying just is much more inclusive for all the children and and it's also a collective everyone's on the same page and that they can introduce things in a in a way that's very meaningful for the children but also the stem concepts can be introduced meaningfully as well so that it picks up on the kind of things that Marianne Hedegaard talks about in her double move which is that you have to, you have to keep in mind the concepts that you're wanting the children to learn at the same time as making is supporting those the, the development of the child um, in terms of the the storying and the role playing being personally meaningful for them as well but Prabhat and Bukiri you might wish to add to that because I think it's a very it's a deep question you're asking it's not a simple one <laughs> no it's not I think that the, uh, the key asset behind that is the drama, the way that we can create the drama and how the, the child, the, the educators can pick up that drama, uh, experience it and um, use it as, um, uh, as uh, a leading activity uh, in order to, to find out more and more and you know, in order to use the concepts in an everyday way uh, and uh, um, use it in a way that uh, can actually lead them to a more scientific understanding, uh, understanding of the concepts. Um, what do you want to add to that? Maybe? Well, just maybe half a line, just to say that uh, probably, you know, uh, we are also drawing on the linguist work that uh, these are not situations of role play. These are largely situations uh, where the collective drama or the collectiveness is something which is very important. So people are engaging in collective fiction and storybooks create a fantastic possibility to create that collective fiction. Right. Thanks, thanks, brother. Um, our next question, Chantelle, I think you have that from the um, YouTube. Yes, we do, Mandy. We've got heaps of questions and comments flying through um, by a lot of attendees at the moment who are all very impressed with um, the expertise on our awesome panel at the moment. Um, so we've got a question from Maddie online. Do educators tend to leave the play when safety issues arise or say for parents arrive early for pickup or lunchtime, etc.? Or do they tend to stay in the play and address these issues in play? That's a very nice question. I'll start. Um, in, in the um, example of the Robin Hood, the um, educator, it, there was a moment where um, a particular tool had been left in the play area that possibly uh, could be dangerous. And the educator skillfully um, continued in role to discuss the moment where this dangerous implement had been found and just included it in the play. And so started to talk about, look what we found. Um, this could be really dangerous. I wonder who left it here, you know, and, and sort of using the play narrative to nicely remove the dangerous item. Um, so in role to be able to deal with those things. And sometimes people ask questions about um, behaviour management or how, how to support children to all be together and um, in relation to not, not so much to do with safety issues but in relation to um, um, just working with children generally. And, and it's the same kind of thing, which is that when the teachers are, the educators are in role, they can use the, their character to support the process of, uh, of keeping the group together. And Glucuria gave some beautiful examples of how that starts to happen in infancy. But for preschoolers, um, it can be, of course, amplified a lot more. So that in role, the educator can deal with whatever the challenge is. If a parent arrives early, it can be, oh, we have a visitor has suddenly arrived into our play world. Um, I wonder why they're here. Shall we, shall we, what shall we do? And sort of set up a, use the moment to do something um, that is still in character. And, uh, but if, it, if it's required for people to leave, then they all together leave the play world. Um, so, so that's why you can distinguish between being in the world and being outside of the play world. But I'll pass over to my colleagues who may wish to add, because it's also a very nice question. 
Um, I'm happy to add in to that one, Marilyn. Um, so similarly, we've had examples for, um, you know, a story where we've got the fairy godmother and we've got elder children in different animal roles and some a child trips over and hurts her knee. Um, so we've had, you know, the educators just go, oh, no, we've had our bunny hurt her knee. Come with, come with the fairy and I'm going to do my magic and I'm going to um, let's let's get you fixed up. And so they still stay in character where they can pull away the child, but staying in character, get put a Band-Aid on or and. Um, um, get them back and it's also you know we've also noticed that the children are very quick to not cry or stop crying and because they just want to keep going so that's been another um, thing that I've noticed. It's a really nice example of how everything is part of the learning and that incorporation of that through the play is that's really lovely thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions so I'm going to keep moving through reasonably quickly and Grace would you like to ask a question from the group please? Yeah, so I've got a question from Indu here. Is it a good idea to consciously pick up stories which break the gender bias? So anyone want to pick that one up particularly? Would someone like to respond? Because I've responded first each time. <laughs> Well, I'm happy to start uh, before someone would like to pick it up. Um, well, I've always um, noticed um, and what from what we've seen as well, it is great if we can pick up stories that um, disrupt the gender bias. So, yeah, you know, just simple things like, oh, you know, if, if picking up stories where it's the mum who is um, fixing the car or um, just having that gender role changed is great because it's a great starting point for other conversations as well. And then it starts to get um, children to pick up other characters. So we have girls wanting to be, um, you know, the, the daddy dragon or we've had the boys, you know, willing to start to um, take on different roles and look at different perspectives. So I think that's, um, I definitely recommend picking up those sorts of books. Thanks. Thanks, Tanya. Anyone else want, want to comment on that one? I mean, it's obviously a strong part of the work that you're doing too, addressing the gender bias. Yeah, yeah I, and I, I can add to it by saying that um, um, when, when we look at our examples in the conceptual play worlds, that um, where we've had these successes, it has been because there has been, this, as Tanya said, the disruption to the, to the stereotypical narrative. And this is where, and we also know role models are important in STEM. So having a, a mum who is an engineer or having a mum who's an architect coming in and, and being the expert to support um, the knowledge is important. Similarly, when we've, we've had play worlds around um, where there are, where the characters in some of the books are all he, <laughs> and, and there are stereo, many stereotypical books around, then you 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 can expand it. So so in the story of um, Possum in the House, for instance, um, there can be wise grandma who um, who's a scientist who comes in and as as a character in the story. So you introduce um, you introduce women in science or in STEM generally in in very powerful ways to to support to support that kind of so not just real world. Um, families coming in to be experts um, in, a, in a positive way, but also changing the characters in the story. So an exa example of the Maid Marian as the head engineer because, and, and talking about that explicitly, you know, this book positions, can position girls and, and boys in ways that don't represent or, or support society as a whole. And then making changing that deliberately changing it's very important. We, we've known about that kind of work for a very very long time, uh, but in our conceptual play worlds, um, that's also a very important dimension. Mm, yeah, actively incorporating it in those ways. Yeah, um, Chantal, uh, you have another question. Thanks. Yeah, a really good question actually. Um, did the uh, this is from Prachi. Um, asking, did the conceptual play world involve children with de developmental delays or disabilities at any point of time during the study? Could the and could the experiences be shared, please? That that was asked a couple of times as well from a few others, um, and in particular also with with the um, with the involvement of the engineering um, team as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a really, really important question that Prachi's asked. And in the, in the um, coincidentally, the story of Robin Hood, 
um, had did have uh, and and various other play worlds did have children uh, with I mentioned the language expression, um, but one of our PhD students who's um, uh, very soon to graduate is actually made at the focus of her research, and she's um, she's she's been able to and she'll present this at some at present this. But it's to say that, yes, it's been looked at. Play Worlds has made a huge difference to, to children with language expression challenges and other children with disabilities because of all the reasons I mentioned before. They don't have to negotiate. They just can use a few words of the character and they're included. Um, so, so it's a very, very important um, uh, conceptual Play Worlds makes a really big difference to children with um, a range of, uh, of disabilities. And we have another PhD student who's um, looking at play worlds in orphanages where there is a broad range of um, um, challenges and um, she, she will present her work as well, but she's been able to show very strongly how conceptual play worlds is making a difference to children with extreme, um, extreme um, challenges um, physically as well as emotionally. So it's pretty exciting. And thirdly to say, um, we have done some previous work which has looked at executive functions of children um, and how that develops through, uh, is developed um, in a really very positive way um, uh, for, for children as well. So the, the conceptual play worlds, um, when there are these kind of tricking games happening um, where children have to use their working memory um, for instance, um, have to self-regulate, for instance. But the play world really supports that because in the play world, they are so, so engaged, so motivated. They just are there and they don't want the play to stop. So when they experience conceptual challenges or they have other challenges that they're dealing with, um, they're just so motivated to just work so hard to, uh, to continue to make that play go forward. Um, and it's the children who drive that. The ed educators plan it carefully, as Prabhat nicely um, presented. Um, and the children's, and we have some research evidence that also shows that um, um, child-initiated play um, has also changed in the sense that we, we have some evidence of children pretending to be children and teachers in a play world, in child-initiated play. So they're making conscious the whole characteristics of a conceptual play world and it's just absolutely delightful <laughs> to see so many many different things it's got so many possibilities and the previous research um, that's we've been inspired by um, is has also shown that too and Marilyn I'm wondering if any of our colleagues Jonathan or Ha from engineering might want to make a comment on this in relation to the design um, process in engineering or how you incorporate that in the work that you're doing I know we're getting really close to the end but it would also be nice to get that perspective into the conversation too so Jonathan or Ha would you like to comment on that at all um so what what really drew me to the the play world concept is um, actually the use of the text and the books is a really because we, we realize that everybody learns through stories right like from very young age we get a we we hear stories we learn we still have to construct stories when we're adults and we we have to tell and communicate things and it's a really powerful device to just circuit break people's unconscious biases I think a little bit especially with kids, if they're coming in and they're used to acting a certain way and now they're acting in a character and the character is, you know, playing a role, then they, I can see how it clearly gets rid of those microaggressions that can um, that pop up just from normal unconscious behaviour, whereas if they're in a role, it gets rid of that and it provides a really safe space for, um, you know, kids to just learn without having all those uh, the other overhead and what better way to actually learn than through stories? I mean, um, we still have to do it. So, yeah, and I was thoughts. wondering that in terms of the design, I think the question came about including kids with disabilities or um, developmentally delayed and whether or not in the design work that you're doing for any of the technologies that are incorporated into this, whether that comes into it or perhaps it's not yet a part of what's going on in the project. Uh, well, in terms of the design, the, these the tools that were well, the, the VR tools. I saw a comment in the um, in the YouTube um, chat 
that's more for educators, um, not really for children to put on um, at this um, at, in the initial conception. Um, in terms of accessibility for the mobile apps, I think Har can probably comment on that. Yes, so for example, the AR, the AR app um, is, is quite nice in that um, obviously the carer can, can sit with the book with the child and, and discuss um, the spatial relations concept, you know, over and under and across. Um, but the AR um, app also allows the child to be able to do that um, by themselves if, if they wish to. Um, and the other mobile apps as well, um, they, they are quite nice in that they, um, they should be quite intuitive for the child um, and also quite easy for an adult who's not quite familiar um, with it to, to help the child. So I, I think we should be able to, to cater for um, children with um, uh, developmental delays uh, as well. Um, I guess we haven't incorporated, so I guess children with um, uh, who are vision impaired, um, we, we haven't uh, thought of that with a couple of the mobile apps. But with the um, the book, the AR, that there will be an, an audio um, file, so so there will be a voice saying, "Now Rosie is going over the haystack." So that, that's part of the design. Yeah, great. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Well, we'll look forward to the next report from the next year on uh, of the project, and maybe these are some of the things that um, the group will be attending to as the as the work develops. So I understand that we have lots more questions online, but we're coming up to the end of time. So it's fantastic to see just how much energy has been generated around tonight's um, session. So thank you again very much to our presenters, Marilyn, Glykiria, Prabha, Tanya. Uh, Jonathan and Hart, this has been a really fabulous session. I'm sure everybody will agree. And I'd also like to thank the behind the scenes people because this doesn't happen easily. There's a lot of work that goes on in, in bringing it to you. So thanks so much to Chantelle and Grace and Luke uh, to helping us make this a very smooth presentation as well and um, working with us to be able to present it tonight. Um, so we, in our conclusion, um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. I can't believe we've had over 540 people watching us, as well as the, you know, all the registrations that we have that have taken up to a thousand people who have been really interested in what's going on here. So 